Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to our second panel of the day which we've called Hearing Colour, Seeing Sound. And in this panel we've brought together three papers which are really about collaboration. There's a collaboration between peers and um, in the first paper and then in the second two there's a collaboration between different disciplines. So our first paper uh, I'll introduce to you the, the papers first and then we'll go into each uh, speaker and if you have any questions that come up to you as we are going through the different presentations please type them into YouTube and we'll ask them at the end so speakers please don't answer them when they come up but wait till the end so please enter any questions into the chat okay so very pleased to um, introduce our first speakers Ellen Adair and Alexandra Antonopoulou and um, Eleanor is an uh, academic and critical technologist, Dr. Eleanor Dare, and her PhD comes from Goldsmiths from the Department of Computing. She was formerly a reader in digital media and head of programme at Royal College of Art, but she now works with Central St. Martins and Cambridge University. Um, and she lectures and uh, supervises PhD students at a number of different universities. And Alexandra is course leader at University of the Arts London and a designer. She's taught design, story making and immersive environments at Goldsmiths and the Royal College of Art. Her practice has been showcased in many different galleries, including Victoria and Albert Museum, Tate Modern and London Design Museum. And um, she also holds a PhD in design from Goldsmiths. Um, following their presentation, we have a collaboration between Kate Steenhauer, Andrew Starkey and Jack Craven on painting music using artificial intelligence to create music from live painted drawings. And the collaborators are Kate Steenhauer, who is a visual artist whose practice looks at the dynamic and interactive capacity of drawing and dialogues with other art forms, technology and their relationships with the audience. And um, she's collaborated with lots of different disciplines like dance, opera, music, sound, text and artificial intelligence. Andrew Starkey, who she's working with on this project, is senior lecturer at the School of Engineering at the University of Aberdeen with over 20 years of experience in artificial intelligence. And they're also working with Jack Craven, a software engineering and aspiring entrepreneur who's a recent graduate from the University of Aberdeen. And then finally, our final panel, looking at collaborations between um, music and animation. Um, music as a Path Guide to Animate is by Elaine Gordieff, who um, also has a PhD in Fine Arts from um, FBAUL in Portugal. She's an independent animator, professor and researcher, a member of ASIFA and the Society for Animation Studies. And she's also a producer and animator and director of more than 16 animated shorts, which have been shown at festivals all around the world. She's um, written a number of texts on animation and is the author of the book, Aesthetic Interference, the Stop Motion Technique in the Animation Narrative. So very pleased to have such an amazing panel of different speakers. And let's start with our first talk by um, Ellen Adair and Alexandra Antonopoulou. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm um, Alexandra Antonopoulou uh, from the University of the Arts. And I'm Ellen Adair from Cambridge University. Um, so um, this talk uh, will examine how virtual spaces become the focus for a collaborative animation project conducted online under conditions of pandemic lockdown. Uh, in the absence of intimate proximity, we remediated our physical research methods, deploying VR spaces and ping pong as a conversation method in the Unity game engine, and also an artificially intelligent third collaborator, collaborator or what we call the co wiggling to evoke our practice of working, writing, and researching while in the world of parks, food play, and sensory engagement. 
all of which we have lacked under lockdown. Um, this also involved inventing and animating fictional uh, collaborative islands where we could meet weekly to research and write and to share drawings and animated works. Um, so in the first slide, we have one of those videos of a, um, an island that um, um, some, some of the work that we've created. Um, okay, these methods are not nostalgic. They're not a nostalgic practice, but a means to examine how new forms of visual, sonic, animated and embodied storytelling might become possible across distances and circumstances. In a way, we reassembled our pre-COVID sounds and senses, memories and collaborative methods within virtual space, while being acutely aware of the surveillance nature of those spaces and fatigued from being online, mediated for most of the day. Here, the Riverine Archive, an unstable repository for our collaborative work. And um, here is um, one of the islands of the animations that we've created while um, uh, being thinking that uh, under lockdown we're in, um, meeting in different islands. Um, so um, within that, uh, to avoid a neoliberal framing of technology as idealized or utopian, we've deployed Brecht's uh, 1964 alienation effect or A effect with our animation, which we call Animersion. This occurs when people are encouraged to question their preconceptions and look at the familiar in a new way, that is to make it strange, but also to surface where power is positioned, where corporate or explicitly political. In our case, one could argue that we've been actors rather than the audience, but at the same time, while we've been visiting each other's imaginary islands, uh, that is one of those, we've been spectators witnessing how each other's imaginary worlds were unfolding. So this was by watching each other's animations or images uh, that we've been sent to each other, reading each other's texts, or even improvising music while meeting in this imaginary island. Uh, this way we maintained a practice of what we call emerticality, which for us is a critical immersion, uh, to remain mindful of the platitudes and hype so often associated with virtual and the digital technologies. So emerticality is a portmanteau term created by us in 2020. It combines the word criticality with immersion, evoking a form of involvement which avoids the hypnosis of being unaware of mediation, influenced by Brecht's alienation effect, as Alexandra said, a distancing process which sought, seeks to move audiences between their immersive involvement in drama and a sense of the conditions under which representation takes place. Emerticality is political and affective, asking of those who engage with virtual and extended reality to also consider the conditions of its making, its rhetoric, for example, the so-called empathy machine, of Chris Milk, this hyperbolic term for the supposed power of VR to evoke empathy in audiences. Emerticality disputes such overdetermination and hype. It questions the construct of empathy, which negates analysis of technology's entanglement with militarism. And so, um, so um, the, the, this video is is um, is interesting. It comes from the glitches of our of our own collaboration, um, and and our work moves between immersion and sober separation, between poetic spells and unbeguiled analysis. So these kind of conversations are, are important for us. At the same time, the nausea in the river in our archive acts as an immutable mechanism to break the metaverse fantasy of unsituated views from nowhere or god tricks, as Haraway, as Haraway 1988 describes our supposedly objective knowledge. We cannot remove our being in the world from our embodiment and locatedness. We're not gods. Immerticality reminds us of our bodies, it makes and breaks a spell of mediation, pulling us like a spring tide in it and out of the waters of immersion. The river is a key theme within our work, an agent and collaborator. We've used the tides of the Thames to define the patterns of a collaboration to carry away biodegradable work we no longer wanted to own. We've used the river as a metaphor and walked within the Thames and the River Ravensbourne while recording narratives. The colour of the Thames captured on CCTV has also been used in our live performances and workshops, hence our framing of the river as a kind of agent, one which always has the potential to capsize our truths and destabilise what counts as knowledge. 
what follows here is an attempt to explain and analyse our work on riverine relations, which may at times only confuse further. Um, well, lockdown, we also deployed an Olympian animation approach, returning to the algorithmic process of our earlier work, the five books. To re-energize our collaboration under conditions of anxiety and isolation, we developed and used a chatbot to represent a place. Um, so in the, also in the next slide, um, this is the chatbot. This, this brought to our project a new set of agencies and imperatives somewhere between chaos and order, defamiliarizing familiar patterns of writing and deploying it in an AR animated works. We remediated ways with methods of material thinking in the same ways that Carter in 2005 uses the embodied nature of material to produce new understanding about ourselves, our histories and the culture we inhabit. For example, thinking through drawing, animation, model, make, model making and sound, which all of them we've produced during our collaborations. Our work may be seen as a manifesto for a representational shift within contemporary technological practices, in particular VR and virtuality. We urge artists, developers, directors, viewers and audiences to turn away from mirrors of realist correspondence and immersion and instead to engage with virtual reality of dynamic practices and actions. This is an assault on the Cartesian split between subjects and objects. It is intended as a provocation and a spur for new forms of virtuality, animation, pedagogy and practice. For me, the issue is this. How do we stop everything being subsumed into a neoliberal model of everything as business? It is connected to the construct of platitudes about asystemic empathy, heavily associated with virtuality, which most of my work has addressed in recent years. For us as workers in the UK HE system, it's also connected to the pervasive assault, assault upon the humanities under the guise of a disingenuous commitment to STEM, creating an artificial binary between disciplines. Um, we challenge the idea of an archive as a fixed account. Uh, we've been interesting on the data lost um, during that time. And um, since, since the process of, of this archive and its uh, intentions, would contradict our methodological approach. This is based, um, and all our projects are based on physical body-to-body -body performance and relationship. Um, this paper instead introduced the idea of an archive that it is in constant flux, like it's a mutable structure, one that celebrates the idea of occlusion and the value of intersubjective emergence. We're interested in an idea of a mutable archive that resists to, to fix document, resists to fix documentation and leaves space for non recordable energy, the non recordable energy of togetherness. Um, togetherness, collaboration and performance are all uh, methods of our work. And this archive allows for the data to dip beneath the surface and re-emerge when variables come together. Um, our work as designers, critical technologists, writers, as well as academic researchers seek to identify the chances and challenges of virtual collaborative environments, adapting an interdisciplinary and intermedia approach at the intersection of gallery, games, film, theatre and fine art. Um, here is an augmented, augmented reality versions of our models from um, by books. So we have chosen to work with a flow of data that's essentially positioned between chaos and order. Um, in this way we define the Riverine archive uh, as a system having what in Deleuzean terms might be described as a diagrammatic uh, quality. Such qualities are contingent, nascent or diagrammatic. These are conditions that Gil Deleuze described as being necessary for generating the new his description is highly resonant of a river. The diagram is indeed a chaos, a catastrophe, but it's also a germ of rhythm. It's a violent chaos in relation to the figurative givens. So uh, we use image making, narrative animation and technologies as a way of becoming disorientated and defamiliarized with our everyday working lives in our rooms um, last year during COVID, uh, last you know, year and a half during COVID and um, to escape our routines and reinvent aspects of our work. Um, we both longed for the times we used to meet at the Healy Fields, which is a leafy uh, park in South East London, uh, with a cafe, a bowling green, a children's playground, and a ping pong table, all of which featured, featured in our virtual uh, version of the park. 
Um, during the second lockdown in 2021, we decided to recreate those meetings, uh, those physical meetings at the Healy Field, where, uh, while also recreating the chatbot and training it to become the place, the Healy Fields virtual space. So we wrote down some of our memories from the Healy Fields to feed our chatbot bot and make it learn about this location, this park in South East London. So um, at Healy Fields, uh, ping pong was an important ideation method for us. Uh, we've been playing ping pong uh, there and um, while playing ping pong, we've been hitting ideas back and forth. Uh, we, we've been creating ideas with the body through the movement of the hand, through the anticipation of the ball and during the pauses around the table. So ping pong became um, a, a very important ideation method. And this would um, resonate when we created um, a Healy Field chatbot during that um, uh, lockdown, during the second lockdown. So we've used co-agents, including ourselves, other people, algorithms and places. A chatbot was created in Python by me deploying the chatbot library. This enabled us to train it with a corpus of common terms, but also through the unique conversations we had about hilly fields. We also trained the chatbot on our creative and academic writing, as well as general knowledge about South East London. After a few iterations of training it, it could quite effectively evaluate probable responses. Sometimes the responses were nonsensical, but other times they were uncanny portraits uh, and uncanny, uncanny mirror of ourselves. Uh, so, um, Virtual Healy Fields created in Unity um, with a uh, soundtrack from uh, Zoom conversations and um, throughout our work with Emerticality, we've, we've explored what happens in the moment of breaking, of creating meta-narratives and analysis. How can it be framed as a critical emertical space, uh, a form of meta-immersion and what's the difference between creative flow and immersion? Uh, the work was extended in questioning ways of framing the technological interactions that happened during technologically mediated collaboration and the implication of scenography, world building, dramaturgic, grammar, recording and post-production when we collaborated online. Uh, the archive of our work is in constant flux, um, like the Riverine archive, but also all our work. Um, it's, it's a mutable structure uh, that celebrates occlusion. Um, and uh, in a way that what is interesting for us is um, that it allows for data to dip beneath the surface and re-emerge when variables come together. Um, yeah. So in this context, we're always at risk of being observed by our employers, observed by platforms, observed by Amazon, observed by Google, at risk of being commodified. We've explored how we can move away from these algorithmic constraints to establish more fluid ways of collaboration. We feel that when our collaboration was established, we were able to improvise in the way that musicians do. This approach has direct applications in performance-based pedagogic methods we've used during our online and blended learning uh, and teaching. We realized that throughout our work, we've invented these third parties, these agents and collaborators like the chatbot. These help us to decenter our authority and remove ourselves as the main character. We frame them as coagul agents, coagulants and agents between the fluid and this and the fix. And this helps us dip in and out of our agencies and authorities as authors, creators and educators. Visual art does not need to be a static experience. It can be an evolving and interactive art form, have a transformational, transient and temporal nature. The combination of drawing with other art forms, music, dance, verbatim, is compelling due to its fluidity in the act of making. Creating an evolving dialogue, a dynamic sequence of movements, unfolding in time and pulsating in rhythm while capturing the essence of a figurative pose, gesture or any other subject matter. The fluidity of drawing lends itself therefore very much for performative application, outputs in film, theatre or live installation.
Technology transposes, integrates and presents drawing into a performative setting on a multi-platform level, physical and digital. But technology can also investigate cross-disciplinary relations, for example between drawing and music. Drawing in a performative setting tells a story in space and time, perpetually considering audience engagement as actively and continuously as, for instance, theatre and film engages them. It requires considerations towards firing the style, perspective, aspect ratio of the drawings and the materials you use. With individual gestures and mark making considering elements of creative movement commonly found in dance. How do you adapt inherent levels of reality due to the presence of the artist's hand, body and the materials? How do you renew your canvases and maintain the flow of the production between drawing scenes? You play yourself, yet too can be a character alongside the drawing component. An evolving drawing has the capacity of going through a phase of abstract form and shape before entering the period where a drawing reveals what it is representing. How innovative can you be in your mark making? How different can you describe subject from reality? How to create a sort of liminal space while the audience tries to make sense more actively engaged, involved or appealing to their own imagination rather than just waiting till the drawing becomes officially known? And then there are considerations towards cinematic techniques. How do you frame a painting from a traditionally static presentation to one that is perpetually evolving and transforming? Camera shots, camera angles, camera movements. And how do you collaborate and create a meaningful dialogue? Many of my productions have put this into practice, collaborations with writers, performers, dancers and composers. Feedback from these shows often focuses on the trance-like state many people enter observing the live drawing, on the experience of figuring out what I'm drawing, on how responsive and emotional the art forms are to each other, and in particular on the compelling combination of drawing and music. Why? Why is that, I wondered. Many artists have examined multi-sensory ways of perceiving, analogy between art and sound have been played with, but now, with cutting-edge artificial intelligence techniques available, can we approach the relation between music and art more scientifically? And this is how Project Painting Music was born. Born from a more colder perspective than in my other productions. Born to explore more fundamentally the correlations between visual art and music. Can artificial intelligence replace a human? Painting music uses AI to create music from live painted drawings in real time and unique for each performance. The AI is based on the type of learning used by the human brain and translates tangible painted marks into audible sounds. of artificial intelligence being used to create music from art. There are similarities between art and music. White space on a canvas is similar to silence in music. Highly detailed artwork is like an intricate melody. We can measure the white space on the canvas and input it into a computer brain. These inputs are like the sensory inputs we take for granted. Sights, sounds, taste, touch. 
Based on these sensory inputs, the computer brain can then make decisions on what type of music to produce. Our brains have 100 billion neurons. The computer brain has 25 neurons. What can 25 neurons accomplish? It can still make decisions and it has learned to understand these artworks by analysing over 1,000 images being painted. It then creates notes based on what it has previously learned and what it sees in the painted object. Is the computer brain showing intelligence? This table is relatively subjective but shows what physical parameters we measured in the artwork and what we used as its counterpart within the music domain. The analogy is just our interpretation and also just to get started with our very initial prototype. The computer brain has 25 neurons, representing the amount of white space on the canvas, how grey the picture is or how complex the image that is painted. Each neuron in a computer brain becomes an expert in identifying one aspect of the painting. We can use this knowledge to convert what the neuron tells us into music. The AI brain has also learned musical structure like chords and harmonies. It does this based on how the painting develops, so you will hear the music grow and change as the canvas becomes more full. We are currently working with composers and sound technology experts to improve the fundamental music theory within the AI system and a correlation between the elements and principles of art and music. So in real time, during the performance, the computer takes a snapshot of the evolving painting, the image gets analyzed, the AI extracts the attributes and produces a musical motif and integrates within previous music. There are different ways to create an AI brain in a computer. We are using the AI approach closest to our brain, as this allows the learning to be explainable. This is important since we need to know what decisions the AI makes, as this information is used to create the music. These are extracts from a 2019 performance where we just developed the first prototype. How do we learn? As children we learn through play. We play with our environment. If it is a game, we try to win. We improve every time we play, we learn, and we like winning, and we hate losing.
if we gain knowledge through play, is playing a sign of intelligence? Have we, as humans, evolved to be able to play with the world around us? How can a computer learn? How can a computer play? If it plays, does it like to win? Does it not want to lose? How can a computer understand our world? How can it interact with our world? Mark making has a direct implication not only on the composition of the drawing but also on the development of the music and then the audience themselves. So although drawing is often considered a static art form, the music output transforms this into a temporal and transient product that is dynamic and depends on the order and choice of mark making. And the nature of the drawing process means that the mark making will always be different, even if the same drawing is undertaken. This is also the case for the music, due to the built-in random process for the development of the notes and chords. This lends the entire system to a performance, with no two performances alike. The whole idea of the AI working in real time, so this is not something that is recorded, we do not know what the AI will produce for music, and every time we do it, it is different, because the AI is choosing what to play based on what I paint, and I'm also not painting exactly the same painting each time. So there is an element of risk and an element of danger in there. And this edginess to the performance emphasizes and enhances the story of painting music, centered around the question, is AI good or bad? Exploring thoughts and fears over the application and impact of AI and its prevalence both today and in the future. The project aim is not to create a process that always results in harmonious music and melodies, but that the AI can make mistakes. Harmonious notes may be considered uninteresting by some people, but beautiful to others, or may result in an interesting and novel musical form to, for some listeners, but jarring for others. Likewise, conflict transpires in the visual component through the subject of each drawing and the application of dramaturgical drawing techniques. Dramaturgical drawing transforms a relatively representational drawing to an abstract composition, forcing the audience to consider and question the meaning of the original drawing, as well as the reaction evoked by the development of the drawing. It can induce quite an emotional response by the audience, occasionally expressed as a gasp or shock running through a show. The investment of an audience into a drawing brings on a certain degree of conflict when that same product is transformed into a new artwork. Dramaturgical drawing is also sometimes quite sudden, with a relatively big consequence, both movement and impact being further amplified on a huge screen. How much further can the AI go? Could it learn from an audience reaction to improve the music it creates? Can it learn from itself? Could it start to produce a new form of music? And what of other developments in AI? Companies are using AI to monitor and respond to how we interact with our world. This AI has been exploited to shape our thoughts and our discussions, to provoke discord and disagreement where perhaps there was none. Humans are physical. We have hands, we have eyes and ears. I can touch, I can feel, I can see, I can hear. 
My world is infinite. I have emotions, I can laugh, I can cry, I can be nervous or excited. Computers are digital. They have no hands, no eyes, no ears, unless we give it to them. Computers have no emotions. They cannot laugh. They cannot cry, nor understand what it is to be sad. How then does the AI judge the music that it creates? Its world is binary. Zero or one. Yes or no. On or off. How can humans and artificial intelligence speak together? Will we ever have a common language? A common culture? Is artificial intelligence really intelligent? Or just a poor imitation of ours? Can we join together in a community? A change is coming, a revolution, an evolution, a technological arms race. Should we welcome what is coming with open arms? Or should it worry us, make us anxious? Is this the dawn of a new age of man? A combination of humans and the digital world with artificial intelligence? Can we keep control of our world that we shaped for so long? Or will it now start to shape us? Technology is a tool within a story. It allows an additional dimension to the artistic capabilities of a piece and moves visual art as a traditionally static experience into a dynamic interactive art form that is temporal and transient in nature. Painting Music won the Connected Innovators Award, run by Creative Edinburgh and Creative Informatics. As part of this program, we are designing a portable, standalone system that has the ability of live broadcasting to audiences and creators through any physical and virtual platform. This bespoke product consisting of multiple cameras, lighting, painting board and AI brain allows me to interact and perform with creators and audiences from anywhere in the world, reacting to current affairs related to AI that is already firmly rooted at the heart of our society and perpetually underlying and impacting global decision making and experiences. organizations of this panel and Ars Electronica for the opportunity to talk about animation in a so important medium to a wide and high-level audience. 
My speed to behold the field of artistic animation when it works strongly with music. The objective is to analyze how to create images in movement from a piece of music, considering their nature and the personal experience as an animator. And trying to clarify better which are the main aspects that wake up the author's imagination to create figures and animate them, as well as how can music influence her his aesthetic choice. I will not present any deep analysis on visual or audition perception, however, just the necessary to understand the core of this research. I also declare that I do not have any music literacy. I would like to stand out that music has always been a significant element of my animation works to achieve the emotional goals that I want to express. To target the goals, the methodology is the case of study of two animated shorts in different contests, a supported and no supported production. The first short is Mildinho, it means very small, by Claudio Roberto, is a 2D and paint animation video clip made over the homonymous music by Heitor Villalobos, a famous Brazilian classic musician, and performed by Duojis Branco, a double of women pianists. The animation was a result of a video clips contest from Brazil, so it's a case of sponsored animation. The second shot is modern, a film d'autor and mixed technique. It is the product of a will to create an animation from live action shot as animated sequence. From this premise, I developed the hand time lapse to this initial sequence and just after found a piece of music on a commercial site to create the whole animation. I constructed the analysis based on the studies of distinguished scholars and also considering some indispensable testimonies. The testimonial on the animated productions. Just the beginning, Eugene has music as the ground to the image arise. We knew about Villalobos' life. He had made many tours into the country territory to listen and register the sound from the forest, birds, and nature, and we identified this spirit in Eugene. At this point, it is important to highlight that as Brazilians we appreciate Villa Lobo's work and the diversity of our music. Probably if you were foreigners, we could not identify some weakness within New Gene. Therefore, the personal creative context of the artist was fundamental to perceive the information from music. In this case, we identify three particular moments. First, a more cadence, deep sound, and a regular rhythm. Second, a more fun, free, and variable with five subdivisions. And the last one, a repetition of the first melody. Within the second music section, we couldn't identify rhythm traits from each one of the five Brazilian regions. The Bayan rhythms from the Northeast region, the Indigena flute from the North region, the right pitched and fast rhythms that themes the viola music of central Brazil, the swing melody that was the origin of samba from the southeast region, and the last one with the regional beats on the sound of Brazil. So after the identification process, we start to create the image to represent what the music brought to us according to these thoughts. The image should present the different musical moments to represent the middle part of the music. We would use the flora and fauna from each region as reference. The last music segment should have a similar visual to the first one. However, both are very diverse from the middle part. So, if the middle would be in color with organic figure, the other two parts should be in black and white and abstract. We also watched films by Norman McLaren, Len Lein and Oscar Fischinger. He gave us the idea to work with geometric elements which open a path to represent piano keys in some moments. At the time, the animation had the structure defined, a small clash between light and darkness that resulted in light, with colors and a rich rhythms. It defined how the logical and the structural would bring emotional colors to the sinuosity of the movements. The ending is a result to the beginning. 
After this work concept, we went to the hand test to design the storyboard, comb the music times, look for image and movement reference to the animals that we would use in the animation and so forth. The second shot is modern. There was no idea, script or music being on an undefined, unpredictable proceed. I consider Eugene a design process while modern a physical one. I stopped my thesis because I need to handle the subject I was studying, the difference between animated and live action images. From this context, the live action pictures were formed into images but choosing each picture to create a new sequence. That gives me the idea to apply the image filters individually, what I call it hand time lapse. Most of the sequences were shot from nature. I liked some of the new sequences, but I needed to join them. I did not have financial support or time, so I went to look for a piece of music on the internet. The sound would help me join the time-lapse sequence and stimulate my creativity to create another animated image. After some weeks, I found three spots that moved me. But just the music cinematic time lapse seemed to work well with the sequences I already had. I do not consciously know why this music moved me. I know that it woke up more images in my mind, being the reason for my choice. In short, with many time variations, dramatic and emotional movement, and piano and violin sounds which in the spotlight over the music. Some moments remind me of a drop of water. Consequently, only the stage process I realized that water was the thing, since also the better sequence I had were from water, river, sea and clouds. After that, the image creation process became less blind. I could think about water, enjoy it with my emotions, listen to the music. Therefore, music gave me all information to create. It differs from Eugene, which came along with Villa Lobo's story and characteristic as an artist. The source of the ideas for Mother was me and the music itself. I tried to listen to it with my emotion and not with my ear to bring to my mind anything. So Mother was the result of a search for a way to express emotion inspired by music. Some concepts for important study. The first approach is based on Laurent Julier, the scholar's research on the operation of human reception and memory, and some points stand out. Mainly the perception, cognition, emotion, the sound images, and auditory attention. In the process between visual and auditory attention and memory, we have three possible situations. The pre-attentive process, working memory, and long-term memory. The first is related to the vision and audition, which have simultaneous process in our brain, but without pay attention. Our brain makes a comparative action throughout time with our long-term memory, to know if there is something dangerous or important for us to be attentive. The second situation happens when we pay attention to something. Paying attention to what we hear determines our understanding in its registration by the brain. And the third case, as Inside Doubt has shown to us, is long-term memory. That is related when we pay attention with an emotional child included as a day of our thesis presentation. Some studies identify it as a combination of a semantic memory comprehension capacity in addition to the episodic memory from the life moments, or a declarative memory, knowing what, plus procedural memory, knowing how. These two contexts are used by the audiovisual receptive process to understand what we see and hear. It's good to stand out that this process is the same to the viewer and the creator, since both work and react under these memory connections unconsciously, and that is a great point. As Julia also affirms that the set, perception, cognition, emotion is unbreakable. When the sound enters the eardrum, it is activated and sending information to the brain that processes it, identifying or searching memory for some registered reference. This determines the interpretation of what is heard. 
So, a sound that reminds me of a good or bad memories, that emotional data will contaminate the interpretation process. Our emotional impression color everything that we perceive. And this is another great point. At this moment, we can understand the sound in English. Juliet uses this macadam term to explain that anyone can create a scene just hearing some noise, as a few falling from the tree. Anyone can understand and feel, do it with all the information from the episodic memory. So, when we receive both hearing and visual information, that is very strong to our understanding. That synchronism generates a single apprehension and eventing as something unique and not as a combination of two different stimuli, sound and light. This union is what Philip Ruffy calls symphony, symphonic experience. Observing Walt Disney's work, the scholar affirms that fusion is the best term to describe such a symbiotic relationship between animation, an artificial life force, and the sound, an organic life force. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, who worked with Disney, called that synchronicity Mickey Mouse due to the force of Steamboat Willie's impact. But they state that music can add to image, emphasis, meaning, and any other single ingredient. And that was a substantial entertainment aspect of animation cinema as observed by Gunnar Storm. And in Disney's productions, the beat and instrumental sound effects were created to the laugh and fun of the audience. However, in Fantasia's case, according to Thomas and Johnston, it was the music that gave the ideas and time to animators work. Norman McLean states that many times he also used music as a script, and that the organization of the music sound is similar to the organization of animation. McLaren created his own music to his short neighbors directly on the sound band of the film, but also animated based on music like Boogie Woogie to the short Boogie Dodo. He knew the importance of the sound or the lack of it to complete a scene, considering all image and sound as a couple working together. Other two scholars and professionals on the audiovisual domain Michel Hion and Michel Farrell agree with McLaren, although they present different conceptions. Michel Hion developed the notice continuum acoustic conception about the sound to cinema. Thus, there are cuts and different kinds of sound in a film, so different attention from the public. While Michel Farrell developed the continuous sound concept, since for him, everything is music, is all film sound noises, effects, dialogues, and the music itself. The scholar also identified through Veronique Camp's work that the sound does not exist only according to its source, but there is a contest to its existence which implies iconic information. One observes that the sound continues and iconic sound concepts by Faro are important to this study. So, considering that, how did it happen the creative process for a new human model? Music result from a set of sounds related by musical instruments present a certain melody with the tone, time, duration, loudness, and attack decay. It can also be a combination of repetitions. This is the case for both shots in question, and when creating animation for a piece of red-made music, that happens in some circumstances. Music has a story, like new genius or it may be completely unknown to be created, like in a mad time lapse. In the first case, there are references for the creator to start work. They are consciously investigated or unconsciously for some information already observed by the creator's life, but both interferes with the creative act. Mildino has historical, artistic and cultural references. In addition, we are Brazilian, so there is a use of our episodic memory. In the case of an unknown music, there are two other situations. The choice of music is a question of liking, unconsciousness, and a piece of music with no reference often more freedom to the imagination that diverse of support projects. During a process of the creation of the image, there was a division of the music, observing the music sound waves, 
In other words, there was a selective listen based on the select perception of each part of the music. From each track, the beat of the main instrument served to imagine what movement it inspired. Once modern steam was defined, the image of drops of water should be different. Isolate drops, rain, from pus, ears, snowflake. Somehow the music stuck to work as icons to my episodic memory and my imagination. The same happened to me, Jim, our episodic memories or agitated. Since the sound has a meaning beyond what is heard and for who heard it, Music has the capacity to join anything imagined. These images are the result of the records of the objective and subjective information that the creator has observed consciously and unconsciously, episodic memory, with music, that enforces the alignment to the final studies. Conclusions the creation of the image from an artist will be different from another one, even when inspired by the same music. If ten animators are asked to create moving images about a piece of music, we will have ten different animations. Each animator will have his or her personal interpretation. Music is a different index or information icon, we can say that, for diverse people. In other words, when creating an image for it, this is a potential open world that becomes connected during the process of creating the image. And then, once you join this image and the music, we have another result as Eon and Final affirms. It would be heard and seen as one of the visual pieces of information, since its perception as separate elements does not exist. And it's noteworthy that the audience also interpret any visual and auditorial information accordingly to their episodic memories. And animations, as we do or mother, start another process, the search for a narrative. That is unconscious action. If it is not possible, the audience can let the mind open and free to perceive what is on the screen and not a conclusion about what they perceive. Only when the projections end, the spectator is able to interpret the short as a whole. And answer the questions. There is a process involved in this creative act. The animator's willingness to create image due to a paid work or artistic impulse. The relationship between creator, creating for me is an emotional creative act, as Damasio says, if there isn't some kind of empathy, it's harder to creativity to work. And it's necessary some life experience for music to wake from memories and emotional or physical sensation. Let them arise in the artist, experience in the imagination, the story of music, the references that by chance it brings to the process. So, the common element to all point is emotion. That is the primary element to every human being or animal. Joy, sadness, fear, disgust, and anger, and secondary emotion to human beings. Therefore, it is emotion that music awakens, savoring creativity. The artist must be open to feel it. And how can music influence her his aesthetic choice? The aesthetic issues is always linked to the style and personal taste of each creator. However, music is a kind of territory to artist's work, and each artist will interpret it according to her, his experience, which works as a kind of future. In other words, music will never be the determinant element in the creation process. Obviously, whether the music to be animated is a rock and roll, that already frames the creative space work in. However, how it would be explored depends on the emotional charge of the art episodic memory. The intersection of what is arouses as image and emotion from her, his memories, and other objective work elements is what will determine the artist's choice, taking colors, black and white, drawing style, etc. Depends on he, her, his technical capacity, of course. To conclude, according to this research, the key to all this process is the emotional charge of the artist's life. Our emotions are source and working element to our creations. Thank you for your attention.
You can start now. So, hello everybody, and um, let's start with some questions um, and encouraging all our viewers to uh, write questions in the chat on YouTube and we can ask them as they come up. I thought I might start out by asking each um, paper group um, some individual questions and then I'll go into a more general discussion. So if I start with um, Eleanor and Alexandra, could you start by explaining Ulipian because it's in the title of your yeah. paper and then you, you didn't um, develop that further. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you. So, um, so the Ulipo movement was this movement for potential literature um, from the sort of 1960s onwards with particularly people like Georges Perec and Raymond Quinault, and they used algorithms or, or rule sets, small sets of rules, finite with finite um, endings and beginnings, which are very reminiscent of you know, coding practices that we use in our work. And we've used them extensively to, um, in, in the way we try to explain where there's an element of chance, which I think has a lot of resonance with Kate and Andrew's work. There's a sort of, there's a potential for chaos, there's a potential for order, there's a potential for innovation, there's a potential for dreariness, and, and we kind of really like that. So I don't know if I'll to that. Yeah. And also that, uh, just to add that uh, Ulipian approach was used, uh, especially initially when we used uh, algorithms to set up collaboration and have it as a um, as a theorem for collaboration. Um, and later on, they were kind of dismissed and went more into the the chance and kind of uh, poetic literature side of it uh, that is used in our uh, latest pieces of work, uh, like the River in Archive or the Healyfield's work, uh, or even the, the, the ping pong um, exchange or the ping pong as an ideation method. And an accessible example of that that I'm aware of is a book called 99 Ways to Tell a Story. So there's, um, it's a graphic novel and it's the same story told 99 different times. So it's setting up a rule, isn't it? And following it in different ways. And I was, I was really interested in the islands you designed. So did you design them together or did you, or I imagine, did you design them as a surprise and a present for each other? Yeah, yeah, it was a surprise and a present for each other. Each week we would invite each other to each other's island and we've been waiting for an animation, a letter or something mm. and we would meet in that island. And in that space, in that imaginary space, we would improvise, play music, but also mm. kind of respond to each other. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, though I suppose in the Mozilla Hubs, Alexandra, we were designing those together as well. So there's an element yeah, of yeah, true. Uh, Begita as well as a, surprise, a present giving, which I think is a really interesting part mm. of the collaborative process with, with, with machines as well. So some of these ideas, of, Mouse's ideas about the gift, I think, I think are resonant with everything I've heard today, actually. I thought that was a really nice idea during lockdown that you'd, you'd have this gift for each other. And, um, and um, I'm also really interested in to pick up on something you were talking about, which is um, critiques of neoliberal and uncritical uses of technology. You're, you're particularly um, critical of kind of immersive, shamanistic, trance-like approaches to um, virtual reality, where it becomes almost like a drug-type experience. Ooh. Oh, no, 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 no. I love James Marx's. I love some of the words. I know, you love that. Psychotic uh, yeah. psychosis. With I think they're really interesting questions. What I what I'm what I personally have worked a lot against is um, a sort of a neoliberal rhetoric about generate its predetermining rhetoric about its ability to generate a kind of em a construct of empathy, which uh, I think is extremely neoliberal in in presupposing the outcomes of, of a human uh, encounter with the digital. Uh, there is no reason to believe in this predetermination and very, very unconvincing evidence, apart from gifting to charities that they generate this thing called empathy or have any agency in making social change. That's all I disagree with. I, lo I love the stuff with shamanism. I think that's really interesting. Okay. <laughs> Did you? Uh, okay. So, and then finally, since today we were looking a lot at sound, I was interested in, in your use of sound. You said you use sound from your Zoom conversations. How did that work? 
Yeah, yeah. You, we've used sound throughout the projects from uh, use the, using it initially to punctuate um, the, the, the five books rooms and, and kind of create sounds that, that give an essence of the rooms that we've been imagining. Uh, you've used, we've used the ping pong, the, the ping pong sound, the, part, the sound of the ball as a way to think about exchanging ideas. Um, we've used um, with the Healyfields um, uh, work we've done lately, we've used sound that was a reminder or a memory of what we've been doing during our walks in Healyfields. And I found that quite fascinating because there's a word, uh, remember, do you remember, do you remember, that is constantly kind of replayed. And it's interesting how that, that space that we used to walk becomes like a memory space and how it's changing also through the technology, but also through our own memories, through, through the retelling of the space. Uh, Eleanor, would you like to, to well, add to Yeah, we re-edited we, we, we re a lot of our Zoom conversations and then put them into the Unity game engine with our work with, with Unity. And actually, for me, that was some of the most interesting work. It made me think this bland platform of Zoom, which we all, you know, most, many of us are working on all the time. It's so dreary, it's so tedious, so tiring and so innovating. And actually remixing it, including the glitch, and glitching it deliberately it made it into a sort of material that i found that, that we, we both found more more sort of creatively conducive just was, you know it was a relief from the tedium of our work in five many ways and this was almost like a, a exquisite corpse game between yourselves and the chatbot yeah yeah nice way of putting it yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if i if i move on now to um kate and andrew and jack um i'm interested in the First of all, sort of in the live performances, what was the role of the dancers? Um, actually, the dancers were not included in our painting music project. That was just a, a build up to, you know, what I was initially doing and how uh, okay. my, yeah, my audience feedback got me into thinking about the relationship between art and music. And, uh, and, and from then on, painting music was really born because let's let's investigate it more scientifically if we can and so i was wondering uh, you as the performer of painting um so that you're creating music via a ai was it totally unpredictable I mean, did you start to recognize that certain shapes or movements would generate particular sounds because for me it must have been like playing an instrument you'd start to recognize the rules of the system you were working with you'd start to make particular marks in order to generate particular sounds did you do that and i was thinking particularly about norman mclaren's pen point percussion experiments where he was painting on the the sound strip of film and and generating um sounds from image through painting but you know using oh. film Okay, okay. Well, um, well, to be perfectly honest, we literally finished the AI software like maybe an hour before the performance. So um, the, uh, the one that I was showing you, so um, there was no chance really to get familiar with like how the AI was going to react and things like that. Um, in the meantime, we will be working more yeah, towards how the AI's relationship is with the music. and. Currently, the music is quite simplistic or very simplistic, and we are building, yeah, with, um, yeah, composer, we will be um, adding fundamental music theory. So in that sense, to answer your question, you will be, um, there will be a higher correlation, really, between elements and uh, principles of art and music. So if you make a really big um, uh, dark shape, you will find a low frequency of that in the music. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, yeah, you can build towards a more predictive uh, sense towards that as well. But in a way, yeah, the randomness is still like inherently um, yeah, built in. Andy, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I could. I mean, it, yeah, it, it was unique each time. Um, and it was doing a different tune every time, you know, it was responding to Kate's paintings. But the thing that we recognize the weakness in the in the project is the, is the understanding of music, let's say. I mean, it's not a trivial task to compose on the fly and um, this is difficult um, and even with the AI so the AI is giving some indication as to what notes what range of notes and kind of what tones and what kind of duration that it wants to create and um, and then there's some heuristics there's another form of AI that sits on top of that too which we don't really talk about but that that's also guiding the process and um, in all of that there is a random choice that the AI 
whole system has, which means that although Kate might have been familiar with kind of roughly what it would sound like, it, it was generally different each time and it would vary its tempo, tempo perhaps more than we anticipated and things like this. And um, so it was very different. I mean, the very, I mean, we, we had the two performances, like Kate says, when, we, when you saw the film and we had the rehearsal and then we were pleasantly surprised how nice it sounded because we just, we didn't really know. And then obviously the performance itself, we, we, we the, in front of the audience, we, we also were unsure of what it would be like. And it was, it was um, some of the tunes we thought were better, if you like, some of them were worse. Um, but that was, that's the very nature of the project is that there is this kind of, you know, um, randomness. But the other thing to add in is just also we had it learning styles of music. So we had it to learn, wasn't mentioned, but you know, we had it learn Beatles. We had it learn um, Philip Glass style music. So it would, it would kind of use those as templates for the type of notes and chords that it would then create. Um, and we want to go further with that, with proper styles, like the country or jazz or blues and things like this. I and mean, that's kind of the current direction that we're on. And um, Eleanor raised the point of Daphne Oram and Oramics with her sort of machines for generating. Do you want, do you want to talk about that, Eleanor? Oramics? No, that no, no, it's just, it just reminded me yeah. in, a, in a really great way. I mean, Daphne Oram's one of the absolute pioneers of, of synthesizer. I mean, I, that might be the question is, do you see it as a synthesizer? In yeah, yeah. So I actually I've been working. So I work in a school of engineering at the University of Aberdeen and I've been working with the music department there as well. There's a guy called Peter Stollery. So he's he's very interested in the sound aspect and using AI to, to do that, the synthesization. So how can it how can AI could it can it create new sounds, a new sound, for example, or how can it create something that is interesting or not interesting or whatever? Um, and how can it do that? So that kind of process, which is just about the, the formation of the, the notes. Um, it, it is part of it as well and that's definitely on our, our forward trajectory too I think. So I was wondering about the translation because um, as you know Elaine's showed there's different relationships between animation and um, sound you can have a direct translation or you can have counterpoint you can work with harmony or rhythm or pitch or tone I wondered um, what principles you, you talked about white space I wondered how much you were getting into all these different aspects of music. Yeah, I mean, I, I could come in on it first and Kate could come in, I guess. And um, that's exactly the, the sophistication we want to build in. One of the things that Kate wants to look at is symmetry, for example, in the, the painted object and some of the more principles of art, let's say, applying those and working out what, they're, what, they're, what the relationship to music would be and how we get it to do that. On a more fundamental level, I mean, my research is about AI. And although we're using, in some respects, a simplistic form of AI, and um, the reason we're using that is because it has to be explainable. It has to be something that can can give us a logic as to how it's doing what it's doing, which then means that it can do the type of things you're saying. Uh, yeah, Kate, we had a wanna... yeah. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say we had a speaker last year who was looking at um, Islamic geometry and translating that into music, mm. and he had he had a very mathematical correlation between specific tones and notes and rhythms. So yeah, this, I mean, you can definitely do that. But what we want, ideally, what I'd like to do is have the AI learn music and learn le learn the correlation between the two, and actually then start to produce something. I actually start to compose something using its own internal rules that it's learned from the music that it's seen already. I mean, one of the things we talk about is is that music is a reflection of 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 of, of human history. I mean, music is a, is a language which we you know, we, we've grown up on and we know the history of it. We know, so for example, you know, rock music came along. If you'd played that hundred years ago, it would have been jarring, but we get used to the, the language of it. Um, and that's kind of what we want to try and build on and get AI to understand simple things and then try to get it more sophisticated. Were you going to add anything, Kate? Uh, no, uh, I'm ready for the next question. <laughs> okay, so... Um... I was thinking about um, which, which one should I go to now? Oh, yeah. So um, this morning, Lily Husbands, uh, sort of following Norman McLaren, was talking about um, abstract animation as a, a form of dance in which um, the viewer experiences kinesthetic empathy with the abstract shapes. And um, I wondered how your audiences responded to um, your live performances. Did they become, you know, did they feel some kind of empathy with the painting? Did they just see it as a novelty or what was the audience response like? 
Yeah, generally the audience, uh, are, um, well, I'm, I'm told it's very mesmerizing and um, like uh, quite, uh, um, um, yeah, and also, yeah, the emotional reaction, well, the most clearest emotional reaction is when you transform a painting. So when at the end, um, yeah, I call them dramaturgical drawing gestures. So, you know, you, you, you pour water over it, but as long as there's meaning then, but yeah, often you do hear a gasp or shock because people have invested in that drawing and to change the meaning of the drawing because that is what they have to then reconsider and and it's amplified on a big screen. So there is quite a, a shock to it. And uh, yeah, I've had people like crying in performances in different productions. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm not saying this is necessarily the drawing, but it's the drawing and the music combined, I think that somehow works quite well with our brain. Um, talking and, and drawing um, sometimes can become quite overloading, especially if the drawing is very illustrative um, and, and the talking is very illustrative, it's, it's too overloading. So I have to calm down my visual. So things like that, you have to play with and be aware that you're not overloading the audiences and, and get the full attention that you want them to have and, and invest in the whole process. But uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of emotional reactions to, uh, yeah, to some parts of my productions. And to follow on these points about being critical about the technology we used, it's quite interesting you, you talked about music and sophisticated un understandings of music being needed to underpin the AI. And I was thinking about, you talked about the use of AI as somehow scientific in its analysis of the image, whereas researchers such as the Algorithmic Justice League show us that there are prejudices, our, our limitations are, are hardwired into the algorithms that we write. And I wondered what you thought about that. Yes, it, it's true. I mean, like AI, it's, um, you know, the data gaps that are existing in our society, it's really scary. And if you think AI is going to, you know, slowly take over, those data gaps are only going to be amplified, you know. So uh, on a statistical level, it's scary because, you know, well, especially some of like, uh, you know, uh, feminist issues are not going to be taken into account and only going to be amplified and made worse. So it is in a way is quite a scary thought uh, what AI is doing. And it's, it's not the fault of the AI. It's just what do you what you put in, you know, is what you're going to get out. So there is, yeah, inherent bias. So, um, yeah, it's uh, and it comes down to uh, ethics in that sense. So, yeah. Uh, I forget. So I forget the question now. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that, well, you answered it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. And, good. <laughs> and, and just fine. Oh yeah. Sorry. Can I, can, I, can I just comment quickly on that? Because it's an AI question as well. Yeah. And I think the issue here is that um, most AI is black box, and that's where we get the problem with the bias you're talking about and the, the morality and the ethical questions that come with the use of AI, because it can't explain itself. That, that's at the heart of the research that I'm, I'm doing. It has to be explainable. And actually, it's the heart of painting music because it is explainable. So painting music isn't, and it doesn't have the same bias. Or if it does, we know what the bias is because it explains to us what it's doing. And the 99% of AI applications don't do that. And that's the problem. They're not explainable and therefore the bias is hidden. And then that's where the danger comes from. Were you going to make a comment, Eleanor? You wrote something. Yeah, I just want to. Is there not also the problem that a regression algorithm? You you said that it was learning from styles. If if those styles reinforce the domination of a particular culture, what 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 do you do to avoid that? That's the problem with the racism that emerges through not not your work, but through through. Uh, no, no, exactly. It comes down, to, but what we're talking about is how it makes its decisions. So the racism mm -hmm. issue, for example, comes from the fact that it's making a decision which is wrong. Well, this we... to, the inherent logic is regression, well, regression yeah. algorithms replicating the status quo, arguably. Not explainable. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the point. It's yeah. not explainable. If it can explain itself, then it would be saying, oh, I'm choosing this because of a black person. But that's wrong. The logic is wrong. So because, but, but it can't, yeah. because it can't even explain to us what that logic is, then it's hidden. And then we see this, the, the, the misuse of AI. And um, if AI is explainable, then it, all of a sudden it's transparent. And these, these, these issues would be we'd be able to see them. We'd be able to say, oh, it's making its decision in the wrong way. We see the same thing with self-driving cars. It can't explain itself. It can't explain how it makes any decisions. And that's where we have the, the tragedies of, of, you know, with the woman that was, that was killed by knocked down by the Uber, Uber car. That's why, because it can't explain itself. Same issue. Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, 
I, I have to ask just one more question because there's one in the chat. Leopold Zika says, why does the AI not paint? The human yeah. painter is redundant. I was going to comment on this. So in theory, we can go both ways. Again, because, for this, because of the same reason as we've been discussing, because the AI is transparent, we can actually go to the, the other direction. So if someone's creating music, we could then use that to create images. So we could, in theory, do it, but it would require an additional AI to do the painting part, which we haven't developed. But in theory, we could easily do that. But obviously, just remember, the question on YouTube is kind of um, insinuating that, that that, yeah, the, the human page is redundant. It's not. We need something to seed the process of the AI to create the music or the other way around. So we would need music to create to create painting or we need the painting to create music. Okay, so let's let's go over to Elaine now. So um, I was interested that um, in your paper, you're rather than um, some people who have very abstract um, relationships between music and um, image, uh, like this morning there was there was people they were mainly using abstraction um quite um you know lines and color and so forth and um, i was interested your use of kind of light motif so almost returning to classical music who might, who might be thinking of trying to replicate birds or nature that you were looking at specifically brazilian cultural memory and evoking that so it was more evocative yeah, uh, in the scale of uh, Eugene, it's the, the video pick, uh, the even the history of the musician, because he was Brazilian too, the, 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 the sound of music that seemed like the main sound of, from Brazil. So there is no no way to 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 took all this information <laughs> take it off and begin a new thing. That is impossible. Even because the creators, me and Paulo Cobert, we are Brazilian. So there is no way to, 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 to make the, this, these things a part of us. So I think in this case, it's better to go, to go in, this, in, this, in this subject, go deep, and then so, develop it. Yeah. Because some people working with visual lit, um, music might literally say, oh, there's this particular note, I'm going to use red. And, you know, they, they put very linear um, yeah. correlations between properties of the music and properties of the image. But you, you raise cultural memory, exactly. vocation. Yeah, yeah. And in, in, this, in this music, specifically, there is a middle, as I said in the presentation, that reminds us some rhythms from Brazil, from each region from Brazil. So to us as Brazilians, uh, that was very, very strong, strong force, an emotional force too, because music always dancing with our emotions, eh? in a way, in a good way, but a bad way. So it's not the, 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 the point, but this, movement, uh, I can say that, it's a movement that action, it's like an action inside us. It's a, a, a make a click in our mind. And as I said, it's our exotic memory. It's an unconscious action, it's not conscious. And you can create English. It, is, it can create it, and this creation is not uh, 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 rational to me. It's unrational, it's unconscious. You don't know why you think about a flower, you think about the water, you think about a boat, you think about the sun. The music brings to us some sensations. And these sensations that create, make us create image. And this image makes us also create movement because music is also movement, it's dancing, it's, it's movement. <laughs> and this movement moves us to I, I really like that about Lily Husband's paper this morning where she compared animation with dance and yeah. how we feel a kinesthetic empathy with a kind of a more abstract animation and we're identifying with the, the visualization of movement. Yeah, and yeah, it's a, a felt Olesen. Olesen. Yeah, the, the paper about Olesen. Yeah, yeah. said about that. Yeah. Yeah, so 
I'm aware that we we did start a bit late, so I'll give us five more minutes. So would each um, panel like to just say a little bit in concluding remarks of any sort of synergies they see with the other papers? So let's start with the um, first paper. Eleanor and Alex, what kind of um, synergies do you think you could... Um, your paper spoke to with the others? Yeah, or maybe they're right, or maybe they're not synergies at all. I mean, there's not, there's, there's not inevitable synergies there. Um, I don't think that, I don't or think artificial intelligence- publications then. Until, okay, I don't, artificial intelligence isn't just a tool. It enables and disables, it discriminates, it embeds cultural prejudices as well as interesting things. That's far more than a tool. And increasingly, if it's used as a determining to discriminate in terms of policing, in terms of mortgage payments, then it will have a material impact on people's lives and their ability to, to either be free or be imprisoned. It's part of the, the school to prison pipeline in American racism, for example, British racism. So I think it's far more than at all, and I would, that, that, that's what I'm left with, apart from other great things about all the work. Thank you. What about Alex? Did, yeah, did and, and I... I agree and also I, I also find fascinating the differences between the papers and the different uses of drawing, the different uses of, uh, of sound and, and movement uh, and how, um, as you said, how uh, movement and sound moves us uh, and, and how that relates to technologies and the way we use technologies through that. Uh, so I think it's, it's really important to also look at, at the different uses of technologies within, you know, within the papers or, you know, throughout the papers. And Kate, did you have any concluding remarks that sort of brings together the papers or thoughts provoked by them? Um, uh, well, I don't know, just thinking about um, the AI as a tool, I think I would say I, uh, the AI... You know, what I have a problem is that you use a, a, a technology, whatever that may be, as a, a the, say you, you get the most innovative kind of technology out there. People often use it as a gimmick, you know, it becomes a gimmick and the story is lost. So this is uh, one of the reasons that when I say AI is a tool, in that context, I think I mean, um, you know, the story, it ultimately is about story. Art is about the story and, and, and often it's about people and technology can, you know, enhance that experience or can help that experience or disable that experience. But ultimately, you know, it should play a subsidiary uh, role to the story ultimately. I mean, my painting is a gimmick, you know, it's the story that counts. Um, but, um, and second, uh, the second point on that as well, because it is an because sometimes you have an artist in Canada, I forget her name, and she paints with robots, and she has this big robotic arm, and they like it looks like they do a synchronized dance, and she uh, advertises or PRs herself as a, a like collaborating with you know robotic arms or robots, and that's obviously that sounds very nice and you know a PR kind of you know setup, um, but it kind of annoys me a little bit because it's not, you know, a collaboration. Because if you look up the definition of collaboration, there are people involved, you know. So people create this technology, people um, provide the bias, people are, you know, the cultural references that we are um, like um, uh, taking forward, that is built into AI. Those are the tools that then create uh, and make decisions in our uh, political and, you know, uh, the, yeah, uh, uh, decision making. So it has a huge impact, but I still think, you know, it's a, a, a tool and not a collaborator and uh, in, in that uh, sense, sure. Thank you, Andrew. Do you want to say any concluding? Um, uh, well, I'd say um, Eleanor summed up justification for all my research better than I could, I think. Because, <laughs> I mean, what she stated is exactly why I'm trying to um, develop new, new forms of AI that are explainable, which, which, which meet the, the things that Eleanor talked about. I mean, um, I, f I found a lot of what everyone talked very interesting because it feeds into the philosophy of what we're trying to do, which is make something which is... Um, marrying these different art forms together in a way that's novel and interesting to the audience so um yeah there's actually some things to go away and think about from what what we've listened to this afternoon and elaine did you have any concluding remarks 
And I think it was very interesting because there is true three point of view different from the the the, the drawing of music and, and sound. Yeah. Uh, more technological, less technological, but very interaction, uh, more emotional, <laughs> as I said. So I think it's it's a, a good panel, a good panel to everyone discuss and then think about this this couple, music and sound, music and picture. I think it's very and drawing, because you all had yeah. drawing in there somewhere as well. Yeah, yeah. Image, technological image, or not technological yeah okay well thank you all very much and hope you join us for the next panel um a bit later thank on you. bye bye, bye. thank you